Hey everybody, welcome back. I'm Susan Lindner, your host of the Innovation Storyteller Show. I'm thrilled to have with me today an author, a Wall Street Journal bestselling author and a columnist for Inc. Magazine and affiliate for the Center of Effective Organization at USC's Marshall School of Business. I'm talking about Soren Kaplan. And if you don't know his work, I highly recommend you pick up his newest book called Experiential Intelligence. And we're going to get into some of that today. Soren Kaplan, PhD, I'll have you know, although he wouldn't ask you to call him doctor, is a business insider and thinkers 50 recognized top management thought leader and consultant in the areas of new business models and disruptive innovation. And he formerly led the strategy and innovation group at HP. And today he advises and delivers leadership development programs to thousands of executives around the world and little known companies like Disney, NBC, Visa, PayPal, Colgate, Palmolive, and so many more. But you probably wouldn't know this about my guest and that he is particularly proud of the fact that when he was 13, he won one of the first ever video game contests on the Commodore 64. Who did not have a Commodore 64? If you're a listener here, chances are, you are in this fantastic nerd group of ours called Innovators. And that's probably the highest accolade on your bio, Soren, by the way. Thank you, Susan. I completely agree with that. And it's great to be here. <laughs> so let's dive in. How did you actually get into innovation to begin with? Well, I, I kind of stumbled into it. I was studying organizational psychology in graduate school, and I felt like I wanted some work experience. So I cold called about 30 consulting firms. This is before the internet in San Francisco. One of them took my call, gave me an internship, and it happened to be one of the first innovation consulting firms out there. This was the mid 1990s and HP was a big client. And I weaseled my way into HP and brought kind of some innovation tools and methodologies into the company and then ran innovation and did a whole bunch of stuff at HP for many years. And that was kind of the launch of my career. Wow. And what a transformation, right? HP has undergone so many pivots and shifts really since its founding days, right? I mean, Hewlett and Packard, they were in a garage trying to figure out exactly you know, what kind of company they wanted to start. I, I remember reading that they wanted to start a fitness company. They even like had one of those like fat jiggler machines that we used to see on like, I love Lucy. And was like, eh. I don't think this is scalable. <laughs> and then decided to dive into something a little bit more techie. I was a kid in a candy store when I joined HP. You know, we had disrupted calculate, disrupted slide rules with the calculator. We had, you know, inkjet and laser jet. And we were, I helped develop cloud computing while I was at HP. And it, what was also amazing was that they had, I think we had like 120 different business units or divisions. And the, the model was to allow someone to create an innovation and grow it, and then it could turn into its own division. And so the so I got a real flavor for how entrepreneurship works at HP. And then that led me to do a few startups and also kind of bring that that experience and and some of my education and startup work to leadership development and innovation programs with, with larger companies as well. Did you get a sense when you were in HP all those years ago that there was a rigor associated with whether or not some really cool idea could become a business unit versus, oh, that's a cool idea, but it's going to get subsumed into, or it's never going to scale, that's never going to work. Did you get a sense about the rigor involved in making those decisions? Yeah, but it was unstructured rigor. So meaning there were some tools and methodologies. And so we used them. There was a planning process. There was a lot of customer focused research, but this was even before design thinking and other tools were really prevalent. So there was a lot of informality associated with those approaches. Yeah. And so my, my my experience, and it ties to you know my latest book is experiential intelligence. My experience seeing challenges and struggles and trying to help people with a very unstructured process led me to do my latest startup, Praxy.com, which is about formalizing a lot of tools and templates and processes that really you know require a lot of expertise. But now with 
cloud technology and and digital tools can we can you know kind of hit the ground running and scale it no matter who you are and so trying to connect expertise to scalable processes is is what i'm doing now which i saw the need for 25 years ago so let's talk about that because no great innovation happens without great failure <laughs> and we've all had these experiences of starting businesses and watching them hit a finish line that isn't necessarily triumph, right? Can you tell us a little bit about your own actual entrepreneurship as opposed to entrepreneurship experiences and, and how that got you to the book? Um, I look at the experiences that we have as giving us real intelligence and my failures absolutely made me smarter as painful as they were. And usually they, they are painful in some respect. And so I left HP, it was during the dot-com boom, late 1990s, early 2000s. I left and I started an online software platform focused on building online communities of practice is what it was called back then. And I, I left the company. We had a little tiny bit of funding and then the dot-com bust happened. You know, 9-11 hit everybody's shut down soft, you know, purchasing software, the, the economy just ground to a halt. Right. I, I had two little kids at that a second daughter was born. She was a couple months old when nine 11 hit. And I basically. And you struggled. named her webvan.com. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We, so I, what I did is I retrenched back into what I knew to do, which is really kind of take, take what took control of my situation. And I ignored kind of what was, you know, kind of happening out there and just said, if I educate people on what communities are, then they'll want it. And I, I kind of lost sight of the fact that like there was a bigger economic thing going on. I just felt like I could just educate my way out of this and mark, kind of market my way out of it from a content marketing standpoint. And it totally didn't work because there were just bigger forces happening there. And I also, at the same time, had a big vision for the company. And we tried to build a software platform that had video conferencing and online you know, collaboration, asynchronous collaboration and document management and calendaring. I did not take a lean startup approach to this. So I, was, I just basically did. I had big vision and myopic vision at the same time from a market standpoint. And it was in response to basically a lot of fear that I had about what was going to happen to this company and, and kind of my livelihood. And so that those experiences that I had there were based on a lot of stuff that I learned early in childhood. And I won't go too deep. I go deep in the book. My, my mother had a mental illness, developed mental illness when I was three. My father was rarely around. And by the time I was 16, we had moved 16 times. And so I lived with a lot of uncertainty and ambiguity where I had to create control, very, you know, kind of control my own environment. I, re I realized that I was applying in retrospect, a lot of these early childhood traumatic responses to my startup. The, so I'm applying these experience, this experiential intelligence in the kind of the street smarts I had growing up that I had to have to the adult work environment I was in, and it didn't work. So I took all of that, then I stopped doing the startup it lasted a couple of years, and then I kind of went, progressed through my journey. And it's it's only been recently where I've really reflected on what the dynamics were back then, and then how I have use those those learnings that insight the new mindsets about it to do the next thing that I'm I'm doing now so that that's kind of the in a nutshell my my very tumultuous story with failure yeah and so what's that what's that shift then into praxi because i'm guessing those lessons you know when you look back on it they're painful and, you know, as entrepreneurs, it's not just about us. It's about employees. It's about providing for your family. Those are, you know, it's when we talk on this show often about where failure feels like it's coming from, there's, there's often like, and I feel it for myself sometimes too, is that you have all the emotions kind of sitting around the table and sometimes fear winds up sitting at the head of the table. And I started my business in 2002 in the wake of all of that. 
And so I, I remember those sensations of becoming a workaholic because I was so afraid to take my foot off the accelerator. Yeah, that, that's spot on in terms of some of the dynamics. Fear oftentimes is a driver. And if we're not aware of it, like I wasn't aware of it, then you start to make decisions. And I was making a cascading set of decisions that were just the wrong decisions in retrospect. So yeah. how did that, so how did I that play into to Praxi? Well, you know, as I I always also look at failure is an opportunity to learn, obviously, if you can, you know, reframe, you know, and understand what happened. I look at where I did, I also look at where I did excel in that failure story. So it, an example is we had no marketing budget. And so what the way in which I tried to get eyeballs on our product was content. I was writing content and this is before content marketing was a thing. So I write a bunch of white papers and web pages and I did learn how to do search engine optimization in the year 2000. So I was really on the forefront of that. And we did get a lot of eyeballs on our stuff. No one was buying it, but it, it worked to get visibility. So with Praxy, Fast forward to a couple of years ago, I started, I recognized that a lot of leaders and innovators don't have out of the box tools and templates to do lean startup work or to create a business case. And so what I wanted to do is create instantly out of the box, whether it's a file template or an online digital process that anyone could instantly get access to that. Now there's hundreds and hundreds of tools. There's 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 thousands of different tools you could use. So as I built started building Praxy, what I realized is every tool is a web page. And so I will write up a web page as an article and in a few short years we now have 60,000 people a month coming to our website through organic wow. search finding these tools. So I applied something that didn't, I had to see that it, that there was some element of success in that failure that I could then apply to the future. That's my experiential intelligence that I'm applying today from that experience. Now there's other things as well that I won't apply today because they didn't work. But I think it, I look at what worked in that moment, even though I failed? And then what do I not want to repeat because it didn't serve me well? And where did that come from? And a lot of times from a leadership innovator standpoint, it's coming from some deeper place of fear or of behavior that I learned early on because of my childhood, in my childhood, that isn't serving me well today. And so I need to be aware of that and let go of that stuff as well. So give us an example. I mean, we're talking about innovation stories. So what is what is an example of where you see some of your past experiences either led to led to success or failure as a result of that? And we're we're kind of not cluing in to what's what's guiding. I know Brene Brown says, you know, if you if you think that what's driving is your logic and intellect, let me tell you, they are seat belted or better stated, hog tied in the back seat while your emotions are at the steering wheel. That's her experience of, you know, years of research. And I think she said 16,000 studies, 16,000 participants in her studies about what actually drives human behavior. And it's emotion. It's not intellect or strategic thinking. It's emotion starts first. And if we're not aware of that, then we're already losing is what she says. So what are some of the stories that you can share with us about that? I'm going to share a big trauma related story and a little T related story. Trauma, big T, little T is just life. And I'll give you two examples. So I mentioned my mother developed schizophrenia when I was three years old. And we weren't even aware that that's what it was. It was before real awareness of mental illness. So I lived with extreme ambiguity. Uh, and I wasn't, didn't know if I'd be picked up at, baseball practice. I might have to walk, figure out how to walk home as a second grader. And so that instilled into me kind of a hyper alertness and awareness of my mother's mental state or her body language. And so that need to kind of create absolute control of my environment is what I described that really sort of didn't work in my first startup. 
at the same time, I'm pretty good at living with ambiguity and uncertainty. I have learned how to read the room when I'm facilitating leadership in meetings. I can see really minute facial expressions and kind of get a clue as to the temperament of an individual or a group. So the same things that traumatized me actually gave me some interesting gifts. Of now, superpowers, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then just to also bring it to life in an even more practical way, the small experiences that we have that that I talk about as visceral experiences, when you think about the things that shaped you, anything that elicits some kind of an emotion um, is a clue that it might be impacting you or driving you today. So here's here's some examples of, of that. When I was in high school, I went to go buy a car with my father. And we went to this dealership that's sort of notorious. I did, we didn't know it at the time, but notorious for kind of bait and switch tactic, tactics. Uh -huh. in, in a 15 minute period, we had a, a very uncomfortable interaction with the salesperson. And I could tell that there was, you know, kind of subversive like, sales tactics happening. I saw my father getting pretty agitated. It only lasted 15 minutes. In that moment, I took on certain beliefs like salespeople can't be trusted. People who are trying to sell me something, I just fundamentally can't trust. And that has impacted me negatively over time as I'm talking to potential business partners or trying to navigate you know, a, a sales process where the salesperson is probably just trying to be helpful, but I'm just hyper, overly hyper alert, yeah. So, so that has gotten in my way in various business situations. Um, right. Even now, when you want to buy something, right? That someone is right. actively trying to sell to you. You're always like, hmm, is that person on the up and up? That is exactly right. And I'm sure my demeanor isn't very pleasant. It hasn't been pleasant to people who are just trying to help me out. So that's not how I want to show up in the world. Now, on the flip side, that same experience instilled in me a desire and recognition that I want to understand other people's motivations in any interaction. And so what that also gave to me is a real desire to empathize with customers and do design thinking, research, and focus on some of the, the cultural experiences I've given to myself and my family over the years that have really broadened my understanding of people. So again, certain things that impacted me, and I call it a self-limiting belief, I can't trust people or salespeople, as well as a self-expanding belief, I want to understand people's motivations. Those both were instilled into me in a 15-minute period that then I was letting drive me in certain ways. And some of it was a strength, some of it was a, you know, kind of a limiter, and through my own work, I have gotten in touch with those things and now try to lean into the positive and let go of the negative. I bet you're a hell of a negotiator, though. It, I can understand people's motivations and try to create win-win situations. I, I have done a bit of community mediation and as well as, you know, applied that in my, my business life. That sounds very diplomatic. <laughs> You know, it's funny because I grew up with a dad who I would say was a failed entrepreneur, you know, like put enough food on the table, but there was not a lot of room for much more than that. And, and he was in sales. And so I had a sense that selling didn't necessarily make you rich. It didn't, you know, like I didn't understand that there was like a process or a cultivation or a consulting side to being a help. I just knew that for a lot of people, it didn't work out well, but I, I started in sales at 13. That was my first job selling Indian clothes in a flea market. And so wow. the level of haggling and bargaining, especially then living in developing countries where bargaining is the essence, like I, I love it now. I love seeing all 360 degrees of how to talk about a deal, diagnose a problem, really be a help and support. Um, really find out where the margins are, really find out where the avenues of expansion. And there's so much more in the in the world of sales that I think as innovation folk, we don't really spend a lot of time thinking about. And yet our job is to sell breakthrough ideas to innumerable audiences. 
whether it's the CEO, the board, the engineering team, the sales and marketing team, our job, and we forget, is to sell the idea. And it, it, so, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say spot on, completely agree. Your experience as a, as a young person in that environment gave you the ability to do your innovation storytelling that you do so well today, clearly. The thing that I would highlight is that when you're in a startup environment, this the sales side of things is really the most powerful and driver because if you don't connect with customers and understand them, then you don't have an innovation because no one's buying it. You need to to do that. Corporate on the corporate side, what you said is absolutely right. You have to sell it up and to the side and down. And understanding, in terms of how I've applied things, understanding people's motivations and how you then articulate the value of what you're doing in their language is an absolute success factor. And so, you know, you you came you came at your skill set because of having to be in another culture and learn that bartering world. And I came at it from a different angle from my used car salesman experience and recognizing that's important. And then we both start doing things to advance those skill sets. And that's really about how we apply our experiences early on. And sometimes it flies under the radar. We're just doing it kind of innately. And other times we can be more conscious about it. And, but it's all like what you said, it's all about communication, sales, understanding motivations, and then communicating in a way that resonates with other people based on their own lenses and what they care about. So in my process, I tell people, number one is for sure, know the audience, but your job is actually when you leave that meeting to make them feel like the hero, i.e. if they, if they wind up adopting your idea and saying, let's go with this innovation. Let's move this next iterative step forward that they will become the hero as a result of taking on the mantle that you've offered to them. What is it for you in terms of, you know, like how, what is your process, Soren, especially in the context of your book, Experiential Intelligence, if you haven't picked it up yet, what is that next step for that innovators should be thinking about and leveraging their own experiences to drive to drive the next step of adoption. I'm really trying to help my audience get their big ideas moving through the organization. Um, I, you know, innovation doesn't happen in a vacuum and you're not alone when you're doing it. You need a team. So let me just give you another quick example from my current business, Praxy.com. So I was introduced to a young woman. She was 22 years old. She had not graduated college and she had no work experience. And she asked me for a job. And I'm thinking, okay, well, not so sure about this. But then I asked her some questions and she said that she had moved from the U.S. to Israel and went into public school where she had to learn Hebrew as a middle schooler. And then she joined the Israeli army and was in there for the compulsory one year and then volunteered to be a commander of a 20 person battalion. And I asked her how she learned how to be a commander. And she said she had to figure it out. And then when I asked her where what she had been doing since that time, she said she just got back from a six month trip to India traveling alone. So I saw this person who basically could also live with a lot of ambiguity, believe that she could just kind of do anything and figure it out. And I gave her an internship. And then within a year, she's now a product manager, managing teams in the US, Europe, and Africa. And wow. so, and she's an all-star. So wow. what, what does that mean? It means that we need to hire outside the box. We need to look at how do we bring people into our teams who have don't just have the 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 job experience on their resumes that say they know how to do innovation, but that really it's about understanding the mindsets and the abilities and the skills that you want for your team based on whatever you're working on from an innovation angle. So that whole team development and looking outside the box of traditional hiring is absolutely essential and can be a real success factor. Fantastic. So give our, give our audience some suggestions of, you know, as they're looking, looking at their own innovation portfolio, right? They're having conversations with the board 
they're having conversations with, you know, other team members and trying to get them on board. How should they be thinking about how they tell their stories and getting, getting people to adopt this next shift? What else, what, from your experience and certainly some of the tools and templates that you've created, what are some of the, the insights you can share with innovation teams to kind of keep the momentum going? Yeah, sure. I, I think that today there's a, a huge balancing act between big vision and where we can go with a business model and transforming an industry to what are we going to do in the next six months to prove uh-huh. out this idea? And it's that it's that tension point, which I think all teams have to manage because you need to know where it's going or where it could go. And you need to be as tactical and practically focused as possible in terms of what you can do to prove out the assumptions that then allow you to keep getting the funding and support to take it to the next level. So, you know, from a from a tools and template standpoint, we're talking about discovery driven planning and we're talking about lean startup and we're talking about creating minimal viable products, those kinds of things. But really that tension point from a leadership innovation standpoint is really important because the the more senior you are, typically if you're selling up, you want the big vision and this is going to transform. It's the disruptive view, the, you know, the feet on the ground with your team and in, you know, navigating the big corporate bureaucracy of getting stuff done. It's about what are we doing in the next six months or even shorter than that to just get some traction to prove out that we can keep moving this forward. So it's that balancing act. uh, Or killing, like, you know, strategy and innovation is as much about what you don't do as it is about what you do, because you have limited resources, you have limited time, and killing stuff is success um, because it allows you to focus on other stuff. So a great point. And that's really, I think, a tension that a lot of people feel. And if you're not our clearly... Uh, aware of that tension, it's hard to manage it. Yeah. I, I, not one of my guests is unfamiliar with that tension. Unfortunately, we are, we are in the thick of it on the daily. Is there, where's the room for the moonshot in, in all of this great thinking and leveraging our experiential intelligence to help innovators make the case for going big, going bold, what can we leverage inside of ourselves from our own experiences to help convince the CEO, the board, other stakeholders that the moonshot still matters, not just iterative innovation, little baby steps to go from hot water tide to cold water tide? Uh, you know, moonshots, disruptive innovations, white spaces, blue oceans, you know, whatever we decide to call them, it's really about making a big difference for other people in the world. And those other people can be customers, they can be, you know, shareholders, whatever that is, but it's not about ourselves. It's about finding the the impact that we care most about. If we don't reach into ourselves and see what the things we care about in terms of helping other people are or helping the planet, it's going to be hard to have the staying power when things get tough to to keep going we have to find that within ourselves and so whatever that experience is that has you know kind of helped one find the the purpose the the motivation to make change you know that that is where the 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 fuel comes from for innovation in my view and and that's really a starting you know an important starting point and an important engine that keeps you going so it's back to our why again. That's a fair way to say it. Yeah. So and I'm now going to put you on the hot seat with our three hot seat questions that we do on every episode of the Innovation Storyteller Show. So what is the greatest innovation of all time? I'm going back to uh, the printing press. Yes. Everyone loves a good Gutenberg. That's why it's you know. Gut right yeah, up front. Yeah. It tells you it's good. <laughs> So if you had the opportunity, as you said, innovation does not happen with an individual. It happens with a team. If you had the chance to join any innovation team in human history, which would you join? I'd probably go with NASA and the moonshot of the 60s. There was a lot of incredible 
thinking and action that was happening during that in that team and in that time. Yeah. And what is one thing that absolutely annoys you or you wish for the good of all humanity, somebody would invent something that has not yet been created? What do you wish would exist in the world that doesn't yet exist? I, this is a strange one. And it's something that I hear over and over in organizations and in leadership teams that stops innovation in its tracks every time. And it's the statement that we can't do anything until we have more data. So what do I want? I want the AI tool that allows me to essentially input what I'm trying to do and articulate exactly the data that exists and exactly the data that fundamentally doesn't exist, that, that it's okay not to have so that I can then articulate and find the assumptions that I need to test and move things forward fast. So that's the ultimate AI innovation tool. The analysis paralysis override button. There you go. Love, Love it. it. Good <laughs> branding. Good branding on that one. Yes. You, you could make one of those. That was easy buttons. And you just call it the <laughs> AP override. You just bring it with yeah. you to meetings everywhere. <laughs> Love it. I'm in. <laughs> Soren, thank you so much for joining me today on the Innovation Storyteller Show. Where can people find your book, connect with you? Where would you like people to reach you? My website is SorenKaplan.com, S-O-R-E-N-K-A-P-L-A-N.com. And you can find the book, get the, get the first chapter download and other tools from there. Fantastic. Soren Kaplan, thank you so much for joining me on the show today. Thanks, Susan.